Good morning and welcome to the New Hanover County Schools The Morning Show. I'm Sierra Robin. And I'm Jimmy Barnes. This is the week of May 15th through the 21st. This Friday, May 15th, is Endangered Species Day. This day is an opportunity for people of all ages to learn about the importance of protecting endangered species and everyday actions they can take to help protect them. Today we have several special segments in today's show on animals and endangered animals. We also have a new edition of Science Nation from the National Science Foundation. In it, we will see how animals may understand more about language than many of us think. And we have a brand new edition of Cooking with Caitlin. This week, Caitlin shows us how to whip up a delicious meal with just a few ingredients. It is going to be another spectacular show, but first, let's check in with our news anchor, Ivan Santiago, who is standing by with your school news headlines. Good morning, Ivan. Good morning, Sierra and Jimmy, and welcome everyone to your school news here on The Morning Show. Topping the headlines this week, Board of Education holds regular monthly meeting, Holly Tree holds annual arts night, and winners of the Superintendent's Choice Art Awards announced. I will have all these stories and more coming up later in the show. Thanks, Ivan. Okay, get ready to laugh because it's time for our joke of the week. Students in Ms. Clayton's Honors Drama class at Ashley High School have performed these jokes for The Morning Show. Now you can start each day off with a dose of humor. Here's our joke of the week. A pirate walks into the bar with a peg leg, eye patch, and a hook for a hand. The bartender notices the peg leg. What happened to your leg? The bartender asks. The pirate replies, it were many years ago. I was on the deck of my ship when a wave came by and watched a shark on board. The shark bit my leg off. Oh, the bartender Replies, what happened to your hand? It were many years ago. I was walking on the deck of my ship when a wave came by and watched a killer whale on board. The whale bit my hand off. Oh, the bartender replies, what happened to your eye? The pirate replies with, it were many years ago. I was walking on the deck of my ship when a seagull came out of nowhere and pooped in my eye. And that's what blinded you, the partner asks. No, the pirate replies. It was the first day with me hook. Another awesome joke of the week. Thank you, Ashley Honors Drama. And now it's time for our staple here on The Morning Show. This is This Week in History. Our Grand Master of Historical Knowledge has all of the headlines from past times and this week by, in history, brought to you by Kidsville News. Welcome to This Week in History. I'm your historical host, Rocco Slano, covering all the colorful and amazing events that have left their mark on history's timeline. This is the week of May 15th through May 21st. May 15th, 1800. President John Adams orders the federal government to pack up and leave Philadelphia and set up shop in the nation's new capital in Washington, D.C. May 16th, 1929. The Academy Motion Picture Arts and Sciences hands out the first awards at a dinner party for around 250 people in Hollywood, California. In 1930. 39, the award statue was given the name, now famous, of Oscar. May 17, 1954, in a major civil rights victory, the U.S. Supreme Court hands, hands down a unanimous decision in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, ruling the racial segregation in public education facilities is unconstitutional. May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupts in Washington, causing a massive avalanche and killing 57 people. Ash from the volcano eruption fell, fell as far away as Minnesota. The area is still recovering today. May 19th, 1935. 
T.E. Lawrence, known to the world as Lawrence of Arabia, dies as a retired Royal Air Force mechanic living under an assumed name. The legendary war hero, author, and archaeological scholar scrambled into injuries suffered from a motorcycle accident six days before. Finally, your weekend history tidbits. May 20th, 1927, American av aviator Charles Lindbergh takes off from Long Island, New York on the world's first solo nonstop flight across the Atlantic Ocean and the first ever nonstop flight between New York and Paris. May 21st, 1881. In Washington, D.C., humanitarians from around found the Red Na American National Red Cross, an organization established to provide humanitarian aid to victims of wars and natural disasters. That's This Week in History, your ultimate sources for those key moments in time. I'm Rocco Solano. Thanks for stopping by. This Week in History is brought to you by Kidsville News, a fun and effective learning resource for children, teachers, and parents. Kidsville News is always free. Copies are delivered every month to every elementary school in New Hanover County School System. And join us again next time for another journey through time as we explore the fun, fascinating, entertaining, and educational facts that make up This Week in History. We have plenty more of the morning show ahead, including Science Nation and this week's launch menu. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The year is 1929 to 1933. He was the first president born west of the Mississippi River. He was blamed for the Great Depression. He began large public works programs and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. If you guessed Herbert C. Hoover, you're right. He was the 31st president of the United States. This presidential pop quiz has been brought to you by New Hanover County Schools on the Learning Network. Sounds like you could use some Van Goghurt. It's fortified with arch-rich nutrients to improve your math and reading skills. Catch! Van Goghurt, thanks. So what's the deal with your ear? Always with the ear, huh? Feed your kids the arts. For 10 simple ways to learn how, visit americansforthearts.org. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Sierra Robbins. And I'm Jimmy Barnes. There are over 5,600 endangered animals in the world today. Each of these animals are facing a risk of extinction, yet they, are, they all add something unique to our world. There are many different causes which lower animal populations, and each animal has its own story. Today we feature one of, those, one of these animals in honor of the Endangered Species Day, which is Friday, May 19th. Here's our endangered animals segment, which features the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros is a large herbivorous mammal whose distinguishing feature is their large horn or horns that grow from the top of their head. One unique feature of the rhinoceros is the thickness of their skin. It is 1.5 centimeters thick Yet, it is also sensitive to sunburn and insect bites, so they often cover themselves in mud for protection. Rhinos have poor eyesight, but excellent sense of smell and hearing. There are two species of rhinos, the white rhino and the black rhino, both of which live in Africa and more primarily in the southern and middle parts of Africa. A full-grown black rhino can weigh anywhere from two to 3,000 pounds and a fully grown white rhino usually weighs more than 4,000 pounds. They get this weight from their enormous size. Rhinos grow to be about 60 inches in height. The rhino's lifespan is also about 60 years. Although many of them don't live past that mark because they are hunted and killed by humans. In fact, humans are the rhino's only predator. They have no natural wild predators. So why is their population so low? Rhinos are hunted for their horns. Their horns are a huge demand in Asia 
because they are used for ornamental carvings and medicine. It is believed that rhino horns can cure cancer and other illnesses. In reality, though, their horns are made of the same stuff that human hair and fingernails are made out of. So the horns are about as useful in medicine as your hair or fingernails would be. The rhinoceros's population has declined by 97.6% since 1960. Currently, there is only an estimated 25,000 rhinoceroses left in the wild. Thankfully, though, there are organizations such as the World Wildlife Foundation that help to track and protect these animals. Hopefully, if we keep making efforts to save the rhinos, we can ensure that the rhinoceros have a history on this planet as long as ours. There are so many endangered animals in the world, from rhinos to many animals right here in the U.S. and even North Carolina. If you would like to help protect them or learn more, there are many resources online, including the World Wildlife Fund, Earth's Endangered, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Now it's time for our first block of news. Let's send it over to Ivan Santiago, who has several great stories to report. Good morning, Ivan. Good morning, and welcome to Your School News on the Morning Show. I'm Ivan Santiago. Our top story this week, the Board of Education held their regular monthly meeting on May 2nd at the Board of Education Center. On the agenda were numerous awards, the proposed budget for next year, and administrative appointments. With board notes is YSN reporter Bobby Blue. The May Board of Education meeting opened with public comments regarding the proposed 2017-2018 budget. A number of parents, teachers, and community members spoke about the suggested cuts in the AIG program. Under recognition of achievement, students, teachers, administrators, and schools were given awards for their participation in this year's American Heart Association campaigns. Also recognized were the Farm Bureau Agriculture in the Classroom Teacher of the Year and the North Carolina Academically or Intellectually Gifted Teacher of the Year. Students selected for this year's Governor's School were recognized, as was E.A. Laney High School's State Wrestling Champion. Under administrative personnel, Arlene Suggs was recommended as the Interim Assistant Principal at Pine Valley Elementary School. Policies for first reading were presented under information. They were Policy 1100, Mission, Vision, and Goals, Policy 1660, student scholarships for future teachers, and policy 9000, school community relations. While under old business, policies for second reading were featured. They included policy 1320, agenda format, policy 1350, community participation at Board of Education meetings, policy 3410, contract administration, policy 4610, purchasing administration, and Policy 5020, Facility Design. All these items were discussed and approved. New business included review and discussion of the 2017-18 proposed county budget request. After a detailed PowerPoint presentation by the superintendent and budget director, the board approved the request. Also approved under new business was certified personnel recommended for one-year contract gifted advisory annual report, items for surplus, and the Vocational Rehabilitation Cooperative Agreement. Operations had seven items on the May agenda. After discussion and review, the board approved them all. They were Utility Easement Agreement with Cape Fear Public Utility Authority at Hoggart High School, Selection of Construction Management Risk Firms for Myrtle Grove Middle School Renovations, and Roland Grice Middle School renovations. Consideration of bids for Blair Elementary School replacement. Consideration of bids for College Park Elementary School replacement. Consideration of professional services agreement for geotechnical material testing and special inspections at College Park Elementary School replacement. Consideration of bids for Blair Elementary School asbestos abatement 
and consideration of bids for New Hanover High School cafeteria serving line renovations. The next regular meeting of the New Hanover County Board of Education is scheduled for Tuesday, June 6th at 5.30 p.m. in the BOE Center at 1805 South 13th Street. As always, if you cannot attend the meetings in person, you can watch the rebroadcast Tuesday nights at 6 p.m., Friday mornings at 8 a.m., and Sundays at 1 p.m. That's your board notes for May. Back to you. It was an amazing night where creativity sprang forth in a host of incredible and truly brilliant ways. It was Holly Tree Elementary's annual Arts Night. This year's theme, Enjoy the Arts, Just for Fun, took hold of every inch of the school. From the time you entered the building, you were met by a marvelous display of lighthouses and a colorful showcase of birds. Mrs. Novak, the art teacher, and I decided we wanted something that celebrates that we enjoy the arts and we do things for fun. We are inspired by other curriculum areas, by other subjects. Um, so we just decided on that let's enjoy the arts just for fun. Holly Tree's Art Night wasn't just filled with beautiful things to see, but also to hear. Throughout the year, first and third grade students studied, rehearsed, and created joyful noise. Musical numbers at this year's presentation included the songs Just for Fun, Spring, 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 and Catch the Rhythm. Once again, Holly Tree's Art Night was a huge success, one that inspired students to enjoy creating music and art in an inhibited way. The Mosley Performance Learning Center hosted their annual career fair for students. Students were exposed to a host of different careers and had a chance for a few hands-on activities during this exciting day. With the complete report is Wiseman reporter Johan Yellow. The third annual career day at Mosley brought an air of excitement to the school as students had a chance to get a first-hand look at many different careers. Mosley's career day is special because it allowed students to spend over 30 minutes learning about a career and not just a few minutes talking to someone at a booth. Several higher educational entities and local employers set up stations in rooms across the school. The students rotated through the different stations based on a survey they completed about what careers they would like to know about. During their time at a station, they gained real knowledge of a career and even had a chance to sample it with the hands-on activities. In the medical station, students learned how to give shots, take blood pressure, and address wounds. At another station, they learned how music is composed and can be used to create moods and a sense of mindfulness. Well, I did not realize that there was so much health-oriented companies here in Wilmington, very wellness-intentioned, um, things that'll help you kind of just get through life more positively. Yeah, I think it helps out a lot. Actually, in the first station I went to, I had a friend, she wants to do something with mental health, and since we were there, she learned she learned a good bit more. So it kind of, I'm pretty sure it helps people out who wants to learn more about these specific fields. Along with getting a feel for each career, the day also allows students to talk directly to someone in the field and ask them questions. Many businesses told students about the opportunities that they offered and what type of education was needed to succeed in their field. Yes, I do see value because um, I see that students are getting hands-on stuff and they're like thinking about different careers and career day really shows them what different careers there is out there and they really enjoy more hands-on stuff than normal school where you don't get a career day. And what I found is almost 100% of the students have said that they have been affected by career day in a positive way. It made them think more about their career or it initiated thought about career that they hadn't ever even really thought about before. It's been very successful. The kids love it. They get excited for it every year. All in all, it was an informative event for the Mosley students and many of them walked away bright-eyed about their future and the career and educational opportunities available to them. Reporting for your school news, this is Johan Yellow. For all the latest on New Hanover County Schools, join us weekdays at 5.30 p.m. here on Time Warner Cable Channel 5 and Charter Cable Channel 191. For your school news, a complete half hour of all the latest news and information from New Hanover County Schools. Now back to our hosts. Thanks, Ivan. We now have a special bonus edition of Endangered Animals. 
Before we traveled across the ocean and learned about the rhinoceros, one of the world's highly endangered animals. In this episode, we look right at our own state with a highly endangered animal here in North Carolina. Here's one. Here's a, here's our episode of the red on the red wolf. The red wolf roams throughout northeastern North Carolina. They are a smaller and more slender cousin of the gray wolf. They are often found with reddish coats for which they are named for, but they can also have brown, gray, and even yellow coats. Red wolves mark their ter territory and live in packs. However, they tend to form pair bonds with a mate for life. Their packs usually consist of their extended family, including a dominant breeding pair and their young. The size of the pack varies based on the abundance of prey in the area. The packs usually live in dens, which are located in hollow trees, stream banks, and sand knolls. The red wolf's diet mainly consists of small mammals such as rabbits, rodents, and raccoons, but they are also known to eat insects, berries, and deer. They are mainly nocturnal, which means that they are most active at night. They communicate by scent, howls, body posture, and even facial expressions. The red wolf only lives up to seven years in the wild, but in captivity they can live up to 15 years. Their weight ranges anywhere from 50 to 80 pounds, and they measure 4 to 5 feet long. In 1980, the red wolf was on the brink of extinction due to habitat loss and hunting. Their original habitat area was in eastern Texas. In fact, they were so close to extinction that year that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service rounded up all they could find and were able to round up only 20. The species was declared extinct in the wild. However, by 1987, enough red wolves were bred that it allowed them to be reintroduced to the wild. The wolves were reintroduced in northeastern North Carolina, and today there are over 130 in the wild and about 200 in captivity. The wild red wolves mostly live in a wildlife refuge, including Alligator River Refuge, where they were initially reintroduced to the wild. With continued support and breeding programs, we can ensure that the red wolf population remains on the increase and that they have a history on this planet as long as ours. Once again, if you would like to help protect the red wolf or learn more, there are many resources online including the World Wildlife Fund, Earths Endangered, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Now we continue our show with Science Nation from the National Science Foundation. This feature takes a dynamic, entertaining look at the research and researchers that will change our lives. From the latest inventions to the studies that can change the way we perceive the world, each episode is packed with fascinating information. This is Griffin, an African gray parrot. What matter? Wood, good parrot. When Griffin talks, does he mimic sounds or consciously make words? What matter is this? Whoa, good birdie. Comparative psychologist Irene Pepperberg believes African greys like Griffin know what they're talking about. They understand things like colors and shapes and number concepts and concepts of bigger and smaller and same and different, things that we never felt that an animal could do. These birds are showing us it's possible. But color bigger. Good boy. With support from the National Science Foundation, Pepperberg studies the cognitive and communicative abilities in African greys. You like your yellow corn. She says the birds have the social skills of a two-year-old mm -hmm. and the intelligence of a five-year-old. What matter? Paper. Paper, good birdie. Talking with the birds means simplifying language down to mother ease. Instead of asking what something is made of, she'll ask, What matter? What matter? Cork. Cork, good parrot. Pepperberg studies Griffin's ability to identify partially obscured shapes. In the wild, we expect these birds to be able to do that because if you see part of a predator, you want to respond as though it's an entire predator. What shape? What shape, Rose? Corner. That's right, how many corners? How many corners, Rose? How many? Four, good birdie. When testing, she's cautious. What color? Making sure she doesn't send subtle cues to the bird. 
We have control for that so many times. We have different people training versus people testing. What color is smaller? Orange. Orange is right, good boy. Pepperberg says her work talking with birds has benefits for humans. We've used these training techniques with autistic children to help learn speech, learn communication skills, and they do learn. What shape? Corner. It's safe to say that in this lab, the term bird brain won't ruffle anyone's feathers. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. That was really interesting. It would be so cool to have a pet that you could talk to and understand you. Yes, it would. Who knows what the future holds? I'm sure animals are evolving as we do. Science Nation has really shown us a lot of interesting stories and information this year. I look forward to it each week. It has, and I'm happy to say we will continue with new episodes the rest of this year and they will be back on the show next year. All right, it's time for a quick break. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Thousands are senselessly killed by people with no criminal record at all. People like you. Seven thousand high school students drop out every school day. Let's catch them before it's too late. To start helping students in your community, visit boostup.org. Welcome back to The Morning Show. Each month, we are thrilled to spotlight an individual school's Teacher of the Year. In this segment entitled A Plus Teachers, we take the time to get to know a little bit about the teacher's background and get an understanding of their philosophy of teaching that earned them their school's honor, Teacher of the Year. This morning, we feature Laney High School's Teacher of the Year, Sharon Williams. My philosophy is that all kids can learn. They may not learn at the same pace, um, but they can learn it. Uh, when kids come to you, they have such diverse backgrounds um, and so you really have to get to know the kid to be able to reach them on a personal level and so they see that you're invested in them and once they understand that you're invested in them um, they're willing to do whatever. I stay up to, in, um, up to date on innovations in teaching by going to different workshops that the county provides um, I'm the math lead for Math One for our school, and with that, I get to meet with teachers around the county and with our uh, lead teacher for the county, Katie Martin, um, and I, I get involved with a lot of different programs. Um, also, I get a lot of insight from um, things online. Uh, I do a little research and reading on my own uh, just to kind of see what the new trends are out there and to see if I can like pull them into my classroom. To increase parent involvement within my classroom, I try to keep my website up to date, but I do a lot of phone calls, um, not just when a kid is in trouble or not doing well in class. I really like to let the parents know that you know their kids are doing something remarkable in class. Uh, it may not be the best grade, but it may be an improvement of for what they've been doing. And once I make that contact with them, um, you know, it's kind of a two-way street. They give me a call back. Uh, you know, just kind of check on progress and, you know, I invite the parents to come out if they want to come out and meet. Uh, if, you know, if they're worried about what their child is doing in class, then they're more than welcome to come out and we sit down and talk. I like to have the kids there so that they can kind of get a full picture of what's going on. Uh, but I really just have an open classroom, so if a parent wants to come, they're more than welcome. 
I incorporate technology in my classroom by using uh, several different programs. We have IXL that Ms. Ducharme um, bought for our foundation's kids this year. Uh, we were lucky enough to get iPads to go with it, so the kids work as an independent study on some of the topics that we're doing in class, and it makes it a game for them. And I know that sounds kind of trivial to be in high school and kids playing games, but I mean, let's face it, if you, everybody likes to play a game. Um, plus, it, it kind of rewards them as they go along and, um, you know, just kind of helps them see, you know, what they know and what they don't know. And so there's a little remediation progress in that as well. Um, I like to use Castle Learning uh, in the classroom as well. It's another program that we use. Uh, the kids take tests or remediation or just study. And what it does is it just lets the kids know immediately hey, I'm getting it right, or no, I'm not. And if they're not, then that's a key for me to be able to say, hey, we need to really take a look at this. Uh, a fun program that I like to use with the classes uh, is when we start using exponential functions within the class. And so it's more real world experience. And I teach ninth graders. And so, you know, we all have big dreams where we're in ninth grade. Do I want to have this car? I want to have this truck. I want to live in this neighborhood. I want to have this. I want to have that. And so, we do a little real life studying and so I let the kids pick out a car that they want to drive or the house that they want to own and then we start doing the calculations for how much is it going to cost me at the end and to see their eyes whenever they like whenever they look at oh my gosh what started out as a forty thousand dollar car has now wound up being sixty five thousand whenever I finish paying for it it blows their mind and so it's kind of fun to see that because it's something that they they can really relate to um, and making it something that's realistic for them because eventually they're gonna buy these things um, makes it kind of fun to say hey you know we were part of this when you started thinking about it Thank you, Ms. Williams. We have so many great teachers here in New Hanover County School System. It's great to learn about them. All right, it's time now for this week's lunch menu. This is the menu for Monday, May 15th through Monday, May 22nd. On Monday, May 15th, race to the lunch line for a captivating chicken parmesan sandwich, a beef taco served with Spanish rice, or a cheesy cheeseburger. Finish out the meal with barbecue pinto beans and a frozen fruit cup. Then on Tuesday, May 16th, decide on the tough choice of spaghetti with a breadstick, roast chicken served with a biscuit and gravy, or a delicious deluxe chicken sandwich. Finish off the meal with marvelous macaroni salad, a baked potato, and mixed fruit. On Wednesday, May 17th, make haste to lunch to the lunch line for a tasty chicken fried chicken, chicken fried rice with an egg roll, cheesy breadsticks, a pork barbecue with hush puppies and slaw. Finish off the meal with awesome pasta salad, glazed carrots, and mandarin oranges. On Thursday, May 18th, have a nice school cooked meal of nachos grande, fish nuggets, or popcorn chicken. Whichever you choose, be sure to enjoy the wonderful side items of black bean and corn salad, a sweet potato, and diced pears. Then, on Friday, May 19th, dig into a porky pork chop sandwich, a good grilled cheese, or stuffed crust pizza at lunch. Also on the menu are veggie sticks, tater tots, and applesauce. Finally, on Monday, May 22nd, treat yourself to a fantastic Chick-fil-A sandwich, a lasagna roll-up with a breadstick, or corn dog nuggets. Awaken your taste buds with flavor packed black-eyed peas and diced peaches. And there you have it, the lunch menu for this week. In addition to those items, milk, a garden salad, fresh fruit, French bread pizza, and a peanut butter and jelly combo will also be available daily. So many delicious choices. Don't forget you can also start your day off with a healthy and hearty school breakfast. It's time now for our newest segment to the morning show, Cooking with Caitlin. In each episode, our host, Caitlin Ledman, Ledman will show us the ingredients and how to put them together to make an easy, nutritious, and delicious dish. Follow her advice and lead your taste buds to a new and amazing flavors. Here's Cooking with Caitlin. Hello, everyone. 
everybody and welcome to Cooking with Caitlin. I'm Caitlin Ledman and today I'll be showing you how to make a gourmet grilled cheese sandwich. For my grilled cheese, I'll be using three different cheeses from, different, from three different regions. Vermont cheddar from Vermont, Monterey Jack from Monterey, and provolone from Italy. So we have whole wheat bread um, with butter, one buttered side and so we're going to put it on our griddle put our cheddar Vermont cheddar on Monterey Jack and provolone then we're going to put our butter side facing toward the ceiling and then we're going to do the same for our next one cheddar Monterey Jack, and provolone. For our grilled cheese, we're on the side we're gonna use Mount Olive pickles. So, it's a little hard to use a spoon. So, Mount Olive is the pickle state capital of the world. Huh. I think I've actually been there a long time ago, but I don't know. And, oh. I forgot about this. Yeah. So we'll put that on and I think we can flip. Now, need some more browning. Um so Mount Olive is the is also right up the road from Wilmington and I think we can flip this now. Yeah. Oops. Um, okay, I got a good flip. Um, so, this should only take about one more minute to let it brown on the other side. And so, we're, I think it's ready. So, we're going, we have our grilled cheese, our pickles, and um, I hope you have a good day. Thank you for watching Cooking with Caitlin. Back to you. Thank you, Caitlin. That looked like a delicious yet healthy treat. Yes, that definitely looked like a dish I'll have to try at home. Definitely. All right, everyone, get a pencil and paper ready. It's time for the, our morning show math question. This is a challenging problem for you to solve at home. We'll give you the question now and then solve it for you after the break. So put on your thinking caps and get ready to solve because, this, because our morning show math question is here. Okay, we hope you got that down. Spend a minute working it out, and we will have the answer after the short break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? 
one in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism, one in 110. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Sierra Robbins. And I'm Jimmy Barnes. Before the break, we showed you our morning show math question. Were you able to solve it correctly? Here is Elizabeth Crace, M Murray Middle School math teacher, with the solution. Good morning. Our math problem of the day today is Alexa wants to buy a shirt that costs $35. The store is having a 30% off sale. Awesome. And the sale tax for clothing is 6%. How much will Alexa pay for the shirt? So we have a couple things going on here. We know that the shirt is $35, and we know the store is having a 30% off sale. So I'm going to need to figure out that first. And I also know that tax is 6%. This is my tax, and this is going to be my percent off. There's a couple of different ways to solve this problem. I'm going to use multiplication. So the first thing I'm going to do is change my percent to a decimal. So it's going to become 0.3 because you end up moving your decimal point over two places. So I'm going to take my $35 and find out what 30% off of that is to start. So I'm going to not worry about my decimals right now, but I am going to do the math. So 3 times 5 is 15, 3 times 3 is 9, plus the 1 is 105. But I have one number after my decimal, so I'm going to start at the end of my answer and put my decimal there. So that makes that $10.50. So originally, Alexa's sweater or shirt cost $35, but she's going to get $10.50 off. So she has that $35, and she's going to subtract her $10.50 off. And as I need to do a little borrowings, make that work for me. With adding and subtracting decimals, you bring the decimal point down, and you make sure your decimals are lined up. And four. And so now my shirt costs $24.50, but I can't forget I have to pay my 6% sales tax. So I'm now going to do that. And in this problem, it didn't tell me if my sales tax was before or after my discount, so I chose to do it after my discount. And if I want to change 6% to a um, decimal, it's going to be 0 0.06 because you start at the end and you move it over two places and you could always add a zero for the placeholder. So it's 0 0.06%, so I'm going to do my multiplication. Again, when you multiply with decimals or divide, you do not line them up. So I'm just going to multiply across. 6 times 5 is my 30. 24 and 3 is 27. 12 is 14. The next one's zero, so I don't really need to do anything with it. If I look, I have three numbers that fall after the decimal point. So if I start here, one, two, three, it's $1.47. So I am paying $1.47 in tax. But now I need to know the grand total for my sweater. So if I have $24.50 and I add $1.47, remember I have to line up my decimal points when we add and subtract with decimals. The total price of that sweater is going to be $25.97. And now, back to the studio. We hope you enjoyed our morning show math problem and got those brain juices flowing. Each week, we'll feature a new problem for you to solve. We now have our May segment of Snapshots. In Snapshots, we take a quick look at some of the positive things going around our school system. From fun projects to school-wide events to guest speakers and fabulous field trips, there are so many great things for our schools to celebrate. Carolina Beach Elementary students combined recycling with Earth Day to create aquari aquariums out of empty soda bottles using plants, gravel, crickets, snails, and roly-polies on one end and water with fish on the other end. Hoggers architectural students recently visit LS3P, a local architecture firm, to view a design project in progress. While there, while there, they discuss education requirements and job opportunities in the field. They also took a carriage ride down, downtown to view Wilmington's architecture. 
The Williston Band chatted with composer William Owens through Google Hangouts during class. They held a virtual rehearsal and performed Egypt IQ, which was written by Mr. Owens and performed at their spring concert. Students at Coddington Elementary implemented coding to build and control robotic alligators using Lego construction materials. It was an exciting project applying science and math to a physical product. As part of a le service learning project, Williams Elementary counselor Mary Ann Campbell led a FaceTime question and answer session between students and her son who is serving in Iraq. The students also are sending care packages and thank you letters to his company overseas. As a better part, as part of Better Speech and Hearing Month, the NHCS speech language pathologist gathered to raise awareness about communication disorders and how to treat them. It was a great opportunity for them to share ideas and strategies. That was this, this month's snapshots. A look at just a few of the many positive things happening in our school system. It's now time for more of your school news, so let's send it back over to our news anchor, Ivan Santiago. Thank you, Sierra and Jimmy, and welcome everyone to your school news here on The Morning Show. New Hanover County School Superintendent Dr. Tim Markley and members of the New Hanover County Board of Education honored art students from throughout its district at a breakfast. With the report is YSN reporter Kathy Kale. Every spring, New Hanover County Superintendent and Board of Education recognizes outstanding achievement in the visual arts with a selection of submitted pieces to the annual competition. The winners and their parents were honored at a special breakfast with the superintendent and members of the board. During the breakfast, the students chatted with Dr. Markley, board members, and other guests in attendance. The art students shared details and the strategies they used to create their artwork and talked about what inspired them. Um, I did a stained glass rose and Beauty and the Beast was coming out and so I really liked that because that's my favorite Disney movie. So I decided that I wanted to do like the stained glass rose from the movie. Both the superintendent and the board selected artwork from grades K through 12. Artwork selected by the board will be displayed for one year at the Board of Education Center, while artwork selected by the superintendent will be on display for one year at the school system's administration building. Recipients of the 2017 Superintendent Choice Art Awards were Nadine Breeden from College Park Elementary School, Grace Stafford from Blair Elementary School, Aaron Bullock from Trask Middle School, and Logan Gray from Laney High School. I started uh, in, in Ogden Elementary and I really appreciate all of my art teachers that have helped me throughout the years and just given me a basis for art and then um, learning to kind of step into the field of photography has been my new aspect of uh, art and I really enjoy that and just learning all the new aspects about it and I still have so much to learn. Recipients of the 2017 New Hanover County Board of Education Choice Art Award contest were Lily Aguilar Banda from Wrightsboro Elementary School, Sarah Rue from Laney High School, Melissa Looney from Noble Middle School, Makia McNeil from Murray Middle School, Eva Osborne from Pine Valley e Elementary School, Jacqueline Cazarez Manila from Wrightsboro Elementary School, and Ariana Marshall from Bellamy Elementary School. I had a polar bear, and it was white, and it was a winter polar bear, because um, that was, it was near winter, so we did it, and my art teacher, Miss Bayless, um, she put on a polar bear video and she showed us how to do it. And now it's here, and I'm very glad. And I'm very happy that she chose me and I got selected, and yeah, that's about it. The wide range of artwork selected this year had magical characteristics. Each artist, no matter their age, seemed to have a vision and creativity that were truly unique. Both the superintendent and members of the Board of Education had high praise for the students and their teachers. Reporting for your school news, this is Kathy Kale. 
Several schools from New Hanover County participated in the North Carolina Council of Teachers of Mathematics Eastern Regional Math Fair at East Carolina University. The following elementary students represented the Eastern Region and New Hanover County Schools at the State Math Fair held on the campus of the NC School of Science and Math in Durham. Santana Wade from the International School at Gregory and Stuart Rees and Shufor Tate from the Coddington Elementary School. Finally, mark your calendars and help the Advisory Council for Exceptional Students celebrate and recognize individuals and organizations that continue to support and give selflessly of themselves to improve the lives of students with exceptional needs in New Hanover County Schools during the 2016-17 school year. The members of ACES encourages everyone to nominate an individual that exemplifies this description. ACES also encourages you to apply to be a part of their team. Individuals and organizations nominated for their selfless efforts will be recognized at the annual appreciation tea, May 18th from 4 to 6 p.m. at the New Hanover County School BOE Center, 1805 South 13th Street. That's all for now. To watch this week's edition of Your School News online, visit the school system website at www.nhcs.net and click on the NHCS TV logo on the home page. Now back over to Sierra and Jimmy. Thanks, Ivan. Now to end today's show, we will be playing a challenging animal trivia game that will get those brain juices flowing. I'm looking forward to it. Let's send it over back to Ivan, who has all the details. Welcome back, Ivan. Thank you. Today we have an animal trivia challenge. I will ask a trivia question about an animal. If you think you know the answer, you must buzz. The first person to buzz gets to answer. If you blurt out an answer without buzzing or winning the buzz, it will not count. Also, if you buzz before I finish asking a question, you have, the an you have to answer it then. I will not read the rest. Finally, if you are both stumped on one, I will give an answer and we will move on. There are 15 questions. Okay, contestants? Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Uh, first one. What food makes up more than half of a giant panda's diet? Is it A? Oh, I'm not done. Oh, oh, snap. Okay. Is it bamboo? Correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, number two. What is the largest type of big cat in the world? Is it A, lion, B, tiger, C, domesticated cat, or D, cheetah? Is it a tiger? Correct. Okay. <laughs> number three. What type of animal is the largest primate in the world? Is it A, baboon, B, gorilla, C, spider monkey, or D, chimpanzee? Yes. Gorilla. Correct. Gorilla. Uh -huh, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. What is the fastest land animal in the world? Is it A, zebra, B, deer, C, eagle, or D, ch okay? Is it D, cheetah? Correct. I didn't even finish it, but yeah. <laughs> Just... Okay. Number five, what is the name of an adult female horse? Is it A, calves, B, mare, C, bub, or D, fawn? Is it B, mare? Yes. Okay. Number six, groups of lions are known as what? Is it A, packs, B, schools, C, prides, or D, crops? Is it prides? Correct. When did you study this? <laughs> like on, some of this from Lion King. That's the Lion King? Yeah, okay. some of this from Lion King. Like. <laughs> okay, seven. What is the tallest animal in the world? Is it A, long-necked wombat, B, an ostrich, <laughs> C, a giraffe, or D? <laughs> yes, sir. Giraffe. Correct. I wanted to make sure it was on the list first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number eight. What was the first animal to be domesticated? Was it A, the cat, B, the horse, C, dog, or D, cow? Yes. Is it a cat? Incorrect. Okay. Jimmy? It is a dog. Correct. Okay. Oh, yes. Epic. <laughs> okay. Number nine. What is the national animal of Scotland? Is it A, a blue jay, B, a unicorn, C, African lion, or D, a black bear? Is it a black bear? Incorrect. Wait, what was it, A? A was a blue jay. That sounds oh. believable. I'll take the blue jay. Incorrect. It was unicorn. <laughs> That's a thing? I want to find one of these. I want a picture with a unicorn. Okay, number 10. That's what large, point. clumsy, flightless bird has been extinct for 200 years? Is it A, the pigeon, B, the pterodactyl, C, the dodo, or D, the moa? Is it D, the moa? No, incorrect. Uh, wait, read the choices again. The choices are A, pigeon, B, pterodactyl, or C, the dodo. Oh. Wait. 
Oh, I forgot that question. <laughs> <laughs> what large, clumsy, flightless bird has been extinct for 200 years? Oh, the dodo. Correct. Yeah, it's from up. Everybody knows that. <laughs> I died. Okay. Number 11. Which living bird has the largest wingspan? Is it A, the American eagle, B, the European eagle, or C, or C, bluebird, or D, albatross? American eagle. Incorrect. Can you read the answer choices again, please? A, American Eagle, oh, B, bullies. European Eagle, C, Bluebird, or D, Albatross? Is it D? Correct. Okay. Of course, it's the one no one's ever heard of. <laughs> Number 12. The hippopotamus belongs to what animal family? Is it A, the pig, B, the rhinoceros, C, the elephant, or D, the deer? It belongs to the hippopotamus family, but that's not a choice. Yes. Rhinoceros? Incorrect. All right. So it's not rhinoceros, you know that much. I know. Alright. I'm gonna go with the elephant. Incorrect. What? The answer is pig. Pig, really? I was gonna say oh, pig. Okay. Oh, yeah. I can see that. I can, yeah, see, yeah. I can see that. Number 13. Slugs have four of what? Is it A, legs, B, antenna, C, ears, or D, noses? What? <laughs> I'm gonna go on a whim here. Noses. Correct. It oh, is noses. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Number 14. The wild dog, the dingo, comes from which country? Is it A, Australia, B, Africa, C, Russia, or D, China? Hmm. Yes? I'm going to go with, wait, can you read the answer choices, please? Australia, Africa, Russia, or China? Is it Australia? Correct. Okay. Final question. <laughs> I'm gonna take a nap, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> what is the fastest fish in the ocean? Is it A, the sailfish, B, the seahorse, C, the spearfish, or D, the North American trout? Go ahead. I'm kidding. No, 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 go ahead. I really I'm, don't I'm know. giving you. She's letting you. I'm letting you go. Go ahead. If you know it, you can go. No, no, go She's ahead. Just the pot. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the spearfish? Incorrect. Okay. Trout. Incorrect. Okay. It is a sailfish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And our trivia winner is Sierra. Congratulations. Good game, Jimmy. Yes, good game. <laughs> <laughs> well, that does it for this edition of The Morning Show. Oh, remember the best TV of all each and every day. Keep it tuned right here on New Henry County Schools TV, The Learning Network. Have a great day. And a wonderful week. It's awesome. <laughs>